Albright Simmons, also, as I announced earlier, represents the 18 civil society organizations that attended a session organized by the Electoral Commission. And Yao here took them through the issues and, you know, all the points that he has gone through with us now, and even more. But they came out of that meeting issuing a long statement rejecting the EC's path to um, 2020 elections. So, Bright, mm -hmm. listening to him, it does appear that there is no option, and that really the only option is what the EC has put on the table. So you are absolutely right that the 18 CSOs represents, as far as I'm concerned, one of the broadest <coughs> institutional spectrums we have in this country, from activists through all the way through to research-based organizations. It's quite obvious that they will not take this stance if the matters do not strike them as extremely important and that their position as bulwarks against the misuse of public funds, the abuse of administrative privilege and, and discretion was not extremely strong. And I will go over the five major reasons why we disagree with almost everything that the EC has said. Almost everything. So one, we are now in January 2020, right? The EC published a tender in April 2019. Mm. In fact, uh, the tender has ended, and I presume they've done some evaluations, because it's now been, what, seven months? Or more. Actually, well, nine months. Now, if you've gone ahead, published a tender, that presumes you spent at least, I know the civil service fairly well. I've been following it now for a decade and a half. The civil service in Ghana does not publish a tender unless you spend at least three months in preparation. I suspect they spent at least four months in preparation. So as far back as December, they have decided they wanted a new system. As far as I'm concerned, they are currently engaged purely in a PR exercise to legitimize the decision they have already taken. Because there's no consultation. You don't decide in December 2018 when you uh, abrogated the existing contract, did your research and published your tender, which nobody has seen. So we don't know what the expression of interest was, which then led to the request for proposal. Um, if you, you are in the media house, you are in Joy FM, one of the leading ones. Have you seen this uh, expression of interest? No, I have not. Have you seen the request for proposals? I have not, but Good. we have been assured at uh, the last meeting with them uh, mm -hmm. Friday. Mm -hmm that will be part of the process okay. through and through. It's been eight months. Hmm. Good. So nobody in this country, in civil society, in media, have an idea, an idea what is the research that has led to this outcome? Who are the people that were consulted? In fact, even as he was speaking, my very good friend here, very often I realized that he was not willing to mention names, etc. And I'll go through them one by one. So first, what we are engaged here now is a public relations exercise to legitimate the decision that's already been taken. Second, it's a focus on procurement as opposed to problem solving. So I call it the PMP model, public relations and procurement. That's where we are now, as far as I'm concerned. And everything I've listened to has reinforced that point. So that's our first problem with the AC situation. The second problem we have, and here I'll use an analogy, it's like the, a new CEO of Barclays comes into office and he says, we need a new branchless banking system. So I'm going to uproot the entire branchless banking system and implement a new one. Or a new CEO of Selfline comes into office and he says, we need a new telecom network. So what I want is I want to you know, go out there, I'll put the entire system and replace with a new one. Our argument is that this architecture is multi-component. It's not entirely true that the system as it was designed cannot be separated as far as vendor design is concerned. We've looked at architecture from HSB, identification, the Dutch company. We've looked at architecture from Genki. We've looked at the STL integration formats. There is every reason why if we have problems with specific components for it, if you want to upgrade an ABIS, if you want to do some of these things, we can go to um, uh, Genki as an example and work with Genki alone. Because even though they were a consortium, that contract has been abrogated, there has been sufficient time if we wanted to deal with the independent actors that were involved to deal with them. Suprema supplied us with fingerprint scan device and the rest of them. I know people in Suprema who will be very happy to have a consultation around DVDs and the rest. And I'll, I'll, I'll go into more of also those details as we proceed. So number two, if you have a network, and that's what it is, it's a network. You've got your BVR systems. Some of them are basically a laptop connected with uh, peripherals. You've got your AB system in a data, a data center. You've got the individual device and the operating systems that are on them. 
For, for instance, um, Mr. J points out that when it comes to most of these systems, they are proprietary. Yes, the windows on your computer is proprietary. And the windows on that device is proprietary. But there's nothing that stops you from dealing with Microsoft when it comes to that device, because Windows is owned by Microsoft. Nobody, HSB, Jenkins, and the rest, cannot control Windows and say, because it's on our system, you have no right to go to the actual vendor of uh, Windows and deal with them. Linux, Red Hat, and the like belong to other vendors. And there's a room if we want to upgrade, for instance, operating systems on those devices to go directly to vendors, etc. So I don't get that argument at all. And we'll go into them in greater detail. So to summarize that point, you don't uproot stem branch a system that is that elaborate and hope to implement a whole new system as opposed to incremental upgrades and surgical upgrades where it's most important. And that's our, our second point. Our third point is that this system actually has been undergoing continuous upgrades and procurement since 2011. I couldn't believe it when he said to me that now the device started in 2011 and that was the end of it. I couldn't believe it. The degree of candor we need in public service means that if you know we had procurements in 2016, and there were some of the machines there from 2015 and the like, you need to mention it. It's incumbent on public authorities and public servants to be extremely candid. So you, can't, you don't tell us that all oh, the devices started in 2011, when we know, because I have read all your budgets, I've read every medium term expenditure framework, and I've seen all your procurement plans and the likes, and I know that you've continued to buy equipment. In the Charlotte, uh, Charlotte Osei affair, we saw the documents that were provided that show that STL had made uh, offerings to replace some of this equipment. In fact, the UC had gone ahead to do a procurement, which he had uh, canceled and then abrogated their contract and renegotiated down. So we know those numbers. So we know what was purchased. We know what was offered. We know the pricing. And everything that Mr. Jay has told us today is in variance with that fact, uh, record. So that's the third point, which is that we, we're making continuous purchases over time, including the visas that he mentioned. Mm. We've had procurement budgets to implement visas. Every time we have a new district, we need to implement a new visa. And some of those new districts have the visas. So clearly, they must have bought some new visas. So it can't be that everything was bought in 2011. That's the third point. The fourth point we have is that Mr. J makes a lot of, uh, interesting references to error rates. And um, that is going to get extremely technical. I'm going to try and keep it as simple as I can. And that is this. The key error rates in these matters that we've been apprised of is this issue of the false rejection rate. So your fingerprint is in the database and was properly captured. But somehow, when you put your finger on the BVD, it says no. And I understand that the proxy for measuring the false reject rate in this country is the manual verification. So if you attempt to do it and it doesn't work, they do a manual verification. He can explain to us if that is not a good proxy. If the false rejection rate is up, uh, reasonably approximated by the manual verification process, and they have themselves told us that they do it at 0.64% false rejection rate, the, question that every, uh, the point that every Bougainian needs to understand is twofold. One is that the false rejection rate is dependent on the false acceptance rate. It's a calibration, it's a two-sided calibration equation. If you increase the false acceptance rate threshold, you improve the false rejection rate uh, threshold. Why? If you tell the system that, if the thing doesn't look perfectly like it, reject it, then what it means is that for some people that are truly registered, maybe the, the, the image was slightly degraded at edges or something like that, it will reject it as well. So part of that calibration process is our control. We have the means by doing some of the calibration to take policy decisions. Why? Because you cannot have 100% matching rates. It's theoretically impossible. I have looked at all the vendor testing for NIST, you know, they do a competition where they invite multiple uh, vendors to come in and demonstrate their technology. I've looked at the last three or so, and I never saw a 100% matching rate. In that situation as well, we have a single index finger so, uh, approach. So when you do the actual BVD verification, you are doing one finger at a time. Yes, it's true that when you are, uh, you are um, enrolling, you use multiple fingers. But when you are doing the verification on the day, my understanding is that it's a single index approach. Typically, a single index approach reduces some of your accuracy because it's the whole set of fingers uh, prints together that increases the accuracy rate. Now, my argument is that if you are doing, uh, let's say, a false acceptance rate of a certain degree, we can look at comparative systems elsewhere and benchmark what is the error rate. And I'll give you only two. One of the key NIST competitions in recent times set the false acceptance rate to 0.1%, and they got a false rejection rate at 1.97%. Significantly above our 0.64 percent, so it means that when you say that, unless you know, for the people that are likely not to be true, 
only 0.1% of them should pass through. It increases the people who, even though it is true, the system rejects. And we know that because I've looked at the EKTP system in Indonesia very closely. That's the mandatory ID system in Indonesia. And where they set the system uh, to 0.01%, uh, uh, it increased the false rejection rate to 3%. <coughs> so the question is, you have to do calibration, and that process is a policy process. Somebody has to tell us what is today the false acceptance rate that we are using to calibration. That says that, okay, for people that are potentially not the right people, allow it through. What is that rate? It will impact the false rejection rate. And until we are told that, any numbers they give us are not really relevant. The second point I want to make is that to the extent that we have a system that is not 100% right, our way of determining whether we are improving or we are getting worse is to look at the conduct of the elections themselves. In 2012, when we first used the biometric uh, protocol in the world, we were the first in the world in using biometric validation at the, the electoral polls. And the reason we were was that the Kenyans abandoned this, and they had a huge corruption scandal around their procurement for BVDs and BVRs, where the amount of money they were mentioning is like some of the amount of money that we've been told uh, the vendors proposed to use. They abandoned that. And subsequently, what then happened is that they did not use it. And so we used it in 2012. And as far as every literature that I have reviewed is concerned, we were the first in the world. Mm. It was a newer system, right? It was a completely new system. Okay. Our federal rates then, in 2012, were the worst we've seen to date. Part of that is purely maturity issues. The more you use the system, the better it gets. Why am I saying it was the worst we saw? Because it was the only election in the last couple of years where we had failures to the point where we needed to postpone the election to the next day. You remember those days? 33% problem, 33% uh, of polling stations had problems. And we had to postpone the election to the next day. We've subsequently not seen those kind of problems to the same degree. So every relevant indicator from number of rejected ballots, etc., a uh, percentage of rejected ballots, etc., yeah. show that there have been improvements in terms of the management of the election with the same BVMS. So if we want to use the end of, um, if we want to use the actual conduct of the elections as an example, then it, pro it shows that though the technology may, uh, may be getting um, somewhat obsolete over time, at the same time, our maturity in managing them is also improving, and they are balancing out. So it's an empirical point what you do around the trend. Last point, and that's our most important point. There's been a whole bunch of proposed costs that they've given. When he says to you that it's $56 million, you have to ask them, is that $56 million uh, the result of a tender where the least, um, uh, sorry, the, the lowest bidding pro, uh, proponent or the lowest bidder gave you $56 million? Where are you getting that number from? They claim that they wrote to the, uh, the vendor, the integrator, STL, and the STL talked to HSB. And then having done that, they came to them with some numbers. Nobody has seen those letters. We don't know the context in which they were delivered. They said there was refurbishment that was there. We don't know the extent of refurbishment. We don't know anything. But the point is that that's not how you do things in the civil service. If you really want to do price benchmarking, do an RFQ process, not an RFP full uh, tender. Just request for quotations from the 50 or so vendors that I have been tracking all around the continent, supplying the service all over. There's Demalog in this country. There is uh, um, a Laxton Group. That just one in Zimbabwe, etc. If you do that kind of proper benchmarking study, as I have done, and as a lot of the people in the civil society research spare, uh, segment have done, you find out that the cost that you are saying is reasonable. It's actually very high. It's actually very high. So we know from 2005, when DRC got $2,500 per VVR kit, that's 2005, that over time, electronic costs go down. In, and it wasn't surprising that in 2010, Benin managed to uh, do a procurement where the cost of the devices, even though the quantity was far lower than DRC, was still 2,700. And if you do that adjustment, it was then lower, based on volume. 2011 Sierra Leone, 2008, $2,800. Most intriguingly, Kenya 2017, look at the uh, cost of the BVR solution, less than $750, because they're using a MoFo tablet, which is a completely new generation solution. So even if the EC claims that it needs to do a mass replacement exercise, the cost that you are proposing is nothing interesting. I see. Right, so... Uh